Yes. Dr. Skinner, I think one of the sources of controversy between the behavioral approach and the psychoanalytic approach has always been uh, the uh, processes within the black box. Yes. That historically, the behaviorists have only been interested in input and output, and the psychoanalytically oriented uh, people yeah. have been concerned about the psychic processes. How would you describe events in which mood or intrapsychic state appear to be the determinants of behavior rather than the yeah. observable input or discriminative stimuli, such as, for yeah. example, a sniper or somebody who does a very violent act has historically been a very quiet or nice person suddenly shocks everybody with newspaper yeah. publicity. There's no precedent for that type of behavior. The theory being that it's intersecting yeah. processes which are predisposed toward it, which uh, you know, are unobservable. Yes, I don't want to say that I can explain the sniper that way. I wouldn't say that for a moment. I think the, the issue is the extent to which we need to talk about what Freud called the mental apparatus. Uh, I, I think Freud's contribution was showing causal relationships between what people do and what has happened to them in the past. But Freud himself said that his great contribution was uh, the revealing of the, of the mental apparatus. Uh, and I, I, I regard that mental apparatus as a rather inadequate and awkward way of representing the causal relationships. Uh, supposing you've got sibling rivalry when a, when a boy was young, he beat up his brother and his father and whaled the life out of him. Then all through his life he suffers some anxiety because of this uh, punishment he's received. And as a result, he's not able to be with other people comfortably. Uh, uh, is, is he going to haul off and hit somebody, or is somebody going to hit him, and so on? Well, now you could say that the punishing episode in childhood is brought down to the present through a feeling of anxiety, and that the feeling of anxiety is what makes it difficult for this person now to feel at home in a group of people and to be, be natural, and so on. But I would question whether or not the feeling is is a causal stage. I would argue that the punishing episode is what is producing the present disordered behavior. Uh, if, a, if such a person comes for uh, therapy and you say, well, now tell me how you feel about this, he, will, he certainly will tell you a lot about feelings. What he's describing, as far as I'm concerned, is states of his own body. I don't believe he's describing mental states. He's describing his own body which is states of, of his body which are associated with prior punishment, effective or ineffective action now, and so on. And, but to take that as causal is, is, I th is the mistake that I feel is being made. Yes? Well, you, you do, I think you did point out that the ability to respond to a stimulus depends on the state of deprivation, for example. Yes. Food is a stimulus. Yes. Isn't it possible that mood or feeling states can also affect the likelihood or probability of a the reinforcing event where prior the frequency of behavior was high in the presence of moment moods that without any <coughs> intervening change in the reinforcement history, that frequency changes because of the mood rather than because of the Well, what is felt in a given mood is possibly quite relevant, yes, but not the feeling. As a person who has been punished and is therefore very hesitant about doing something, he starts and stops, starts and stops, and so on, will tell you, I feel diffident, I feel embarrassed, I feel a lot of other things. These, these are things he's learned to say he feels because he's been taught by society to use those words in describing his behavior, which I would, we would use, we would describe only the behavior in using those words. You're being very diffident about this, I notice. We have no information about the feelings, but he has additional information about states of his own body, which he puts into the picture called diffidence or embarrassment, and that's what he talks about. And those are, those are important things to notice, but I would say that he is behaving as he's behaving because of the punishing episode and not because of the state of the body he is feeling. Now, if the physiologists come along and give a very good picture of that state, they will have a different kind of intervening situation which will be very helpful when we have it uh, for to, to explain the behavior. We, the trouble with introspective descriptions is their very great inadequacy. The, we, we cannot, I can teach a child red, green, and blue if he's not colorblind, 
But I can't say, now this, this is diffidence and this is embarrassment. Do you see the difference? Because I'm not quite sure when the child is diffident or when he's embarrassed. And I can judge his behavior, and he may very well use the words in terms of his own behavior, but there will be bodily states associated which will come into his description, and uh, they will, may be relevant or they may not be. And uh, so that his, his use of these words is bound to be slightly fuzzy, and as a result, what we call his knowledge of his own body is going to be fuzzy. It's going to be very uncertain. We do not have good self-knowledge because there are no contingencies that shape that behavior. In the experiment that you described earlier, yes. I suppose you would call uh, an abstract tact mm -hmm. pigeon pecks in the presence of property. Right. To what, de to what uh, degree do you suppose that the process that you discussed in verbal behavior could be uh, demonstrated with uh, experiments with non-humans, let's say pigeons? Well, I think many of them could be. I think the work with chimps is promising. Uh, I, I wish the people who were doing it uh, would pay more attention to a, a good functional analysis of what they're doing. Um, the sign language experiments seem to me to be the most uh, profitable here. The artificial ones, poking signs or putting counters up and so on. Those are, those are not needed, and the sign language uh, experiments are very promising. Uh, the, these um, chimps can, uh, can, can do a great deal that no one thought a, a non-human primate could do. How far it can go, I don't know. Whether you could ever teach a chimp something which could be called awareness or self-knowledge. Can you, can you say to a chimp, why did you do that, and teach him to give you an answer? Uh, that's, those things came very late in the emergence of verbal behavior in, in human, sub, in human, human uh, peop in, in people, and I doubt very much whether you're going to get that in the lifetime of a chimp. It's just much too slow in picking them up. Yes.